Arvind. Yes. Give your introduction to the members of this board so that everybody must know that uh, from where you have done LLB and what you have done as yet. I am Har Amrit Kaur. I am from Jalandhar, Punjab. I completed my BCom LLB from Punjab University, Chandigarh in the year 2021. After that, you have uh, done some uh, more education? Uh, no, no, LLB, LLM or? No, sir, my entire focus after my bachelor's was for judicial services itself. Earlier you appeared in any examination of uh, this uh, judiciary? Yes sir, I did appear for Haryana judiciary. You qualified uh, three? I qualified three as well as mains, sir. There was a problem in it. Yes. We hope in this year in Punjab you will be selected. Thank you so much. Sir. See. Yes, Harmant, in a criminal law, there is a provision of uh, releasing the accused on probation. Say something about that. Which persons can be released on probation? Which is the stage when the person can be released on probation? So, sir, section 360 of CRPC, it deals with the law of probation. After the person has been convicted of an offence, if the court is of the opinion that instead of passing the sentence at the very instance, the person can be released on probation of good conduct, then instead of sentencing him, they will release him on execution of a bond. But there are certain conditions which are required to be fulfilled. That is, if a person is of the age of 21 years or upwards, then he has not been convicted of an offence which is for any term exceeding seven years, life imprisonment or death. And in case it is a woman or a child who is below or a person who is below 21 years of age, then he's not been convicted of an offence which is punishable with the death or imprisonment for life. And also he should not have been previously convicted for any offence. Alright. Come to civil side. Whenever somebody wants to file an appeal, which are the provisions? All these filed in civil cases against a decree passed by civil death. See now. So, sir, there are different types of appeal under uh, civil procedure code. The first would be appeal from the original decree, which has been dealt under Order 41. Along with that, we also read certain provisions of the sections of that part. Then there is also a provision for second appeal, which is only in civil cases and it is not there in criminal cases. We also have the appeal which can be filed by leave as of a pauper. There is also a special provision which deals with the appeal to the Supreme Court. Will you explain the procedure that uh, what type of petition is to be uh, submitted before the appellate court? So sir, in case of appeal, the appeal has to be in the form of a petition in which you have to specify the grounds on which the appeal has been put up before the court. It will be known as a petition or something else. Uh, sir, if I can correctly uh, remember, it was a memorandum of appeal has exactly. to be prepared. Yes, the exact word is that, memorandum of appeal. In a memorandum of appeal, what is to be written by the appeal? Sir, in the memorandum of appeal, you have to put down the name of the parties, the date on which the judgment was given by the court, also, more specifically and most importantly, the grounds on which the appeal has been filed, and also in case it is a monetary relief. Grounds are related to what? Sir, the grounds on which the appeal has been put up. Uh, grounds against whom? Against the respondent or? Say that grounds. Grounds, grounds of appeal, objections to the decree that whatever judgment has been passed, what are the objections yes. being raised by the uh, appealant? Because those objections must come. He is not uh, filing that appeal against the respondent, he is now filing the appeal against the decision of appeal. Yes. That court has not given proper decision. Uh, yes, do that point. As from appeal itself, uh, there are two sections, section 100 of CPC and section 41 of Punjab Code Act. 
which section will prevail over the other and why can you cite a few authorities as well so uh, recently even in 2023 and in 2019 also the supreme court gave a landmark judgment in which it held that with regard to the jurisdiction of punjab it is section 41a of the punjab courts act that would be applicable and in also in this recent case of 2023 i'm sorry i'm not able to recollect the name the court also held that for punjab courts it is not necessary to formulate a substantial question of law because in jurisdiction of punjab it is section 41a of the punjab courts act which would prevail over section 100 of cpc and why would it be so because of by virtue of which provision in the cpc so if we talk about uh, this particular then there were three provisions which were discussed the first one was article 372 of the constitution in which it was held that all the laws which were prevalent at the time of the commencement of the constitution and they have not been repealed by the parliament then they would continue to operate so similarly we also have a provision that if because there is usually a contradiction that if there is any provision which is in contrary to the provisions of cpc it would not prevail to this the honorable court has said that because punjab courts act was neither a state law nor a central law but it was governed by the government of india act 1931 so it would prevail over it Uh, can you tell us something about uh, adoption by Muslim, Christians, or a foreigner, and can you specify certain authorities that deal with it? So, if we talk about adoption by Muslims, Christians, or foreigners, they would be governed by the Juvenile Justice Act and also by certain provision of the Guardians and Wards Act. There has also been a judgment of the Honorable Court. Uh, if I can recollect it nicely, it was. A, Lakshman's case I am sorry I cannot recollect that authority in which the honorable court had laid down certain guidelines for the intra country adoption as well according to which only the cara act it had the cara regulations they have come into force please throw some light on the constitutionality of narco test so the constitutionality of the narco test was discussed in two cases one was the Kati uh, Kati COVID case and the other one the Selvi versus State of Kerala, in which the Honorable Court has held that where we have the provision that an accused person he cannot be forced to be a witness against himself, that is the principle of self-incrimination. Because if we talk about narco test, in it there is testimonial compulsion. A person is being asked to make a statement unconsciously. which can directly or indirectly have a bearing upon his criminality or give a witness or be a witness against himself therefore they are not constitutionally valid but the only purpose for which the narcotic sex test can be valid it is for the provisions of section 27 of the indian evidence act and that to only when it is voluntarily given okay can an ex parte divorce decree be set aside If yes, explain with the help of some case laws. Uh, if you could just give me a few seconds to just think about the issue. Uh, so recently, I was reading the Supreme Court judgment in which an ex parte decree was granted by the court even in divorce. So where there is one party who is trying to take the justice by its hand, or it is trying to embarrass the child. in such cases the court will not stand as a mute spectator to such proceedings and in such cases the court does have the power to pass an ex parte divorce proceedings but if subsequently a sufficient cause is being shown then obviously the court can in the interest of justice set aside such decree all right uh, for another there is a provision of temporary ejection which is granted uh, by the court under order 39 can you describe the circumstances in which it can be granted and which is the stage when it can be granted so sir temporary injunctions can be granted at any stage of the proceedings if we talk about order 39 rule 1 such stages before the uh, final disposal of the case but if we talk about rule 2 then the provision is also there then you can grant a temporary injunction even after the judgment in the case can be given 
the circumstances in which the temporary injunction can be granted are the first one being where the parties are at a fear that the property that is the subject matter of the uh, dispute it will be rendered it will be damaged it will be destroyed or otherwise disposed of secondly where you want injunction against the defendant where he is threatening to dispossess the plaintiff and thirdly where he is threatening to dispose of the property in order to default the creditors and under rule 2 also there are certain provisions where you want to prevent the breach of a contractual obligations can you make a reference to some provisions of specific relief act yes sir so sir when we talk about the provisions of specific relief act there is section 36 and se section 37 which deals with temporary injunctions as well which clearly specifies that a temporary injunction is to be given under the provisions of cpc it can be given at any stage of the proceedings and also it will be uh, operated till further orders of the court or under the disposal of the proceedings all right what is a victim compensation scheme so ma'am the victim compensation scheme has been dealt under section 357a which was added by the 2009 amendment act which basically provides that the district legal services authority or the state legal services authority they have been given the obligation to provide compensation to the victims for their rehabilitation retreatment in such cases courts can also make a reference to the board or instead if there is no trial the accused person is unknown in such cases even the parties they can directly approach the uh, district legal services authority board for the purpose of compensation Sir, Section two seventy three of CRPC lays down that evidence must be read in the presence of the accused. Is there any exception to this? And if there is, please give us a suitable example for this. Uh, yes, sir. There are two exceptions that I can currently recollect. The first one is given under Section two ninety nine of CRPC, which deals with a proclaimed offender. So, if we know that a person cannot be arrested in near future. then we will not put at fault the civil the criminal justice system and in such cases the evidence of the witnesses can be taken even in the absence of the accused person and it can be read subsequently during the trial when the accused person has been arrested on the grounds of the witness is dead he his attendance cannot be procured and there are other grounds as well the second exception is also laid down under section 309 of cfpc which i would say is an implied exception that if the party is not if the party is not available it is an absence it is an absence or they are not prepared to examine or cross examine the witness then in such cases the court can record the statement of the witness and discharge the witness without such cross examination or the chief examination all right or on suppose in civil cases the parties have compromised and the court has passed a decree on the basis of compromise but one party it has raised some query some question some objection that this is not a valid decree where he should go for some remedy so sir because order 23 it states that no suit will lie on a decree which is passed on compromise but this has to be read in consonance with the provisions of 1a in the order which is appeals from order where the parties they do have the option to challenge the decree on the ground that such particular uh, such particular compromise should or should not have been recorded only on the grounds that the compromise that they have reached it was either void or voidable in context of the provisions of the indian contract act uh. the person will file civil suit sir you cannot file a civil suit as where, a, he, where he will go so sir he will make an application under order 42 rule 1a before the court yes before the court which passed the decree can he file a civil suit in any circumstances uh, sir i am not very sure about it suppose compromise has been made for the yes then certainly for the board of uh, Indian Evidence Act will also be applicable. That is, also can always be filed for challenging that decree. Yes. Yes, sir. What are inculpatory and exculpatory admissions, and whether both can be admitted in evidence together? So, inculpatory is something which incriminates a person. 
whereas excarpatory is which excludes that person from the incriminating part. For example, I say I killed B in my ex in the exercise of right of private defense. So I killed B is the inculpatory part, and I did it in exercise of right of private defense would be exculpatory part. So we have the case of Palvinder Court where the honorable court has held that such a confession is not a very it, it is not a good confession, but it can be taken as an admission. The only requirement being that you have to take the inculpatory and the exculpatory part as a whole. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, can you explain where the execution proceedings will take place when two subjects districts are formed out of one district? So, in such cases, if both the districts they have the jurisdiction over the property that is the subject matter, then it is either of the districts in which the execution proceedings can lie. Can you explain, uh, can you name the section that states that? Uh, it is section 17 of CPC. I beg to differ, isn't it 37? Ma'am, I am not very sure about it. I will have to read upon it now. Alright, Ivana, next question, one more. Okay, throw light on the concept of euthanasia and India. So, so the concept of, uh, ma'am, the concept of euthanasia is basically said to be it is, there are two types of euthanasia, one is pathif uh, passive euthanasia and the other is active euthanasia. In the case of Arna Schoenbaum and subsequently in the Common Cause Services Society, passive euthanasia has been allowed in our country by virtue of the concept of living will. Passive euthanasia is basically where certain life prolonging treatments, they are withdrawn from the person which is going to result in the death of the person. But active euthanasia where there is an active act on the part, example, we are giving certain injections, lethal injections, to terminate the life of the person, that would not be allowed, and such case would fall either under section 302 or at least under section 304 of IPC. Okay, so what is the present scenario? The present scenario is only passive euthanasia is allowed, and that too after the compliance with the requirements of a living will, and if there is no person to give consent on your behalf, then the court will give the consent in that case. What is living will in that regard? So sir, the concept of living will is, it could be either a voluntary living will or an involuntary living will. Voluntary living will is where a person, during his lifetime, he makes a will that in case tomorrow he turns out to be in a persistent vegetative state or a terminally ill state where there is no chance of any recovery then he himself gives this permission that such life prolonging treatment can be withdrawn. Whereas in voluntary living will is where that person is not capable of giving the consent, then on the recommendations of the medical board, the relatives, the uh, court in its, in its wisdom can give such consent to withdraw the life prolonging treatment. Uh, living will should be attested by which authority in these days? So if you can correctly recollect, I am not very sure about it, but I would like to try it. May I? Yes. Sir, it is to be attested by the Judicial Magistrate First Class. Is this so? Yes. That was before now you can get it registered normally by the Ah, yes. And we got registered from notary public house. Because Latest judgment of Supreme Court was delivered, in which they have, because that was the complicated procedure to go to the court of judicial division. He gives notice to the public, and then they they have uh, shortened this procedure. Yes, you. In IPC, other than amendment Act, yes, there are certain sections yes. which were struck down following uh, authorities of Supreme Court. Can you cite those sections, those authorities and the sections which were struck down as a result? So ma'am, the first one was section 303 of IPC that was struck down in the case of Mithu versus State of Punjab. Then another one was section uh, 497 which deals with adultery which was struck down in the case of Joseph Shine, sorry 397 and also section 377 which has been partially struck down in the case of Nakhate Singh Is it 397 or 497? I'm sorry ma'am, it is 497. Yes, 
So, uh, with, first of all, with regard to the question that was asked earlier, you mentioned Palindar Court's authority. Can you reiterate what you said about it? Sir, it was that in case of when there is a confession which has both inculpatory part as well as the exculpatory part, we cannot take it as a confession per se. It can only be taken as an admission and it has to be taken as a whole. Can you say something about bifurcation of the statements? So, sir, the bi bifurcation of the statements can only be allowed under two circumstances. The first one is where the exculpatory part, it has been proved to be false. And the other one is when it is highly improbable, having regard to the other evidences like the statement under section 313 of CRPC. Okay. Now, can you give us the difference between section 156, subsection 3 and section 202, subsection 1 of CRPC? Yes, sir. So, sir, this difference was discussed in the case of Lakshmi Narayan Reddy versus Reddy case. The first is that 156 subsection 3 is only a proceeding which is taken at a pre cognition state, whereas section 202 is taken at a post cognition state. Usually, 156 subsection 3 is in cognizable offences where an FIR has been uh, registered by the officer in charge of the police station, whereas under section 202, it is a complaint which is made directly to the magistrate. But there is one difference that has been brought after the case of Hirabhai, Hirabhai versus State of Gujarat that 156 subsection 3 proceedings now can also be taken at the post cognizant state but only before the commencement of the trial. You mentioned that 156.3, the FIR is already registered. Or is it that the court <coughs> directs the police to register an FIR. Yes sir, so in 156 subsection 3, it is the court takes the, even before taking the conclusions, it directs the police to register an FIR and thereby to investigate into the case. It can be done uh, post cognizance also? Yes sir, there can has... You, can you give one example that uh, which type of case can be sent to the police to register an FIR after taking the uh, sir, I'm sorry, I cannot recollect the particular example of this. Okay. What was held in that uh, Supreme Court? It was a constitutional bench or three-judge bench? Uh, or three judge bench? So it was a three-judge bench of the Honorable <coughs> Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which held that under section 156, subsection 3, you can read it along with section 173, subsection 8, and the uh, direction for investigation can also be directed at the post cognizant state before the commencement of the trial. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, can you differentiate between the legal service authority and order 33? Yes, ma'am. So, order 33, it is basically dealing with the, um, the provisions regarding leave to appeal by indigent persons. It merely has a simple, uh, it merely has one provision which provides that if the person is not capable of having a pleader, then the court may appoint him a pleader at the expenses of the government. But if we talk about the Legal Services Authority Act, it has a very wide horizon. It is not merely limited to the cases of putting up uh, the uh, suits. It is also giving the legal aid to all the persons. It could be with regard to the pleaders, it could be with regard to the appeal. So the horizon that I believe is not limited in scope as is under Order 33, but it has a very wide expansion of it. Yes, you are. Explain the provisions related to attachment of salary under section 60 of CC. So when we talk about attachment of salary under section 60, because India is a welfare state, so we do not allow the entire salary to be attached. There are certain provisions which have to be taken into consideration that are in ordinary cases, it is only one third of the salary after deducting 1000 from the whole that can be attached, but in maintenance cases, two-third of the salary can be attached. Also, if the attachment continues for 24 months continuously and in only one case, then after 24 months, the court can direct that the salary shall not be continued under attachment for the same decree. Okay. And if there are two decrees where the attachment is ordered, what is the provision for that? So ma'am, if there are two decrees and the uh, a salary is already under attachment by the court, 
then the court will make a record as to why the attachment cannot be made for the subsequent decree and such report shall be forwarded to the court which has directed the attachment of the decree. What is right of subrogation under Transfer of Property Act? So ma'am, right of subrogation is dealt under the provisions of mortgage where a person other than the mortgager himself, he exercises the right of redemption, he will subrogate the, himself in the shoes of the mortgagee. That is all the rights with the mortgagee had against the mortgager, such person will also be given those rights against the mortgager. Which are those persons in your side? Yes ma'am. So the persons could be the person who stands as a surety for the mortgager. It could be the co-mortgagers as well. The persons could also be who has subsequently acquired any interest in the right of redemption. If there is a civil suit relating to mortgages, uh, which order will be applicable? So sir, it is order 34 of CPC which deals with suits for mortgages. So what type of uh, order are passed? In so sir, there are two types of orders, there are two types of decrees. The first one would be a preliminary decree and the other one would be a final decree which follows the preliminary decree. Right. Sorry. Uh, do you recall section 7 of Hindu Marriage Act? Yes sir. So can you tell us if that section is mandatory and whether there are any exceptions to it? So sir, recently there has been the self-respect marriages which have been in news. So section 7 provides that a marriage has to be solemnized by performance of either the Shastric ceremonies or the customary rites of either parties. So before the particular judgment, if I believe so, it was compulsory to solemnize marriage either by your Shastric ceremonies or customary rites. But now because the court has said that the self-respect marriages, they are valid and also there need not be any private declaration, any uh, public declaration of such marriages. So I believe if there is any uh, legislation or otherwise regarding the self-respect marriages, then it can be done even without compliance with section 7 of the Hindu Marriage Act. Can you cite that authority uh, when it was passed? So it has been recently passed in 2023 itself. If I'm not wrong, it was passed in the preceding month, but I do not recollect that exact authority. Have you read that authority? Yes, sir. I have read some portions of it. Right. Share the authority with us also. We will also discuss with you that whether it can be done or not. Yes, uh, what is the discovery by interrogatory? So, ma'am, discovery by interrogatory is where the uh, the opposite party or like the uh, disputant parties they do not disclose a particular fact or any document. Then, in such cases, the other party has an option. If I can collect and recollect, it is under order twelve or order 11, I'm not very sure about it, where you can go for the discovery of the fact with the permission of the court. So you require the party to discover a particular fact or a document which the other party has been concealing. And at which stage it can be done? Ma'am, it is uh, done before the uh, court applies its judicial mind to the proceedings. So it is uh, usually at the first hearing of the suit that you can send it for the discoveries. I'm not very sure about it. All right, Harun. In the civil cases, can a local commissioner uh, cross-examine the witness or he can conduct the uh, examination of witnesses? So, sir, in civil cases, we do have the provisions where the commissioners are appointed, the commissions are appointed for the examination of the witnesses. In such cases, the court may also authorize for the chief examination or the cross-examination of the witnesses by such commissioners. So in these days, uh, uh, chief examinations are written in the court or through some other way? So sir, there was an amendment to the CPC order 18 where now it allows that the examination in chief has to be by affidavit followed by then the cross-examination or re-examination could be in the court itself. It is mandatory or it is uh, just like uh, guidance? Uh, sir, though it is, it uses the word shall, that the examination in chief shall be by affidavit, but there has been certain authorities of the court where they have held that even if you have not been able to put up the affidavit, the witness can be examined in the court itself in exceptional circumstances. No, 
Did I ask some questions of Sir Bingo? Yes, sir, I've read one or two authorities on it. But it is only with regard to the document. Okay, sir. That if the document is to be proved, then the court can exercise its discretion. You have two sections in CPC, section 50 and 52. What deal with legal representatives? Can you state the difference between these two? So ma'am, section 50 basically deals with where the decree was passed against a person, that is the decree, the judgment debtor, and he died before complying with the provisions or the requirements of the decree. So then the decree can be executed against the legal representatives. But if we talk about section 52, it is where the decree was passed against the legal representatives in virtue of their authority or in virtue of their position as legal representatives, when the defendant had died during the continuance of the proceedings, so per se, the judgment is executed or the decree is executed against them in their capacity as legal representatives. Okay, under Article <coughs> 40, appointment of receivers, when a receiver is entrusted with a tenanted property, can he evict that tenant? Ma'am, I'm very sorry, I'm not very clear on that concept, but I'll read upon it. Yes, Rana, you will explain that. Yes, sir. Uh, the tenant, can, the receiver cannot evict the tenant because all the provisions are governed under uh, East Punjab. East the Punjab Restriction Act. Okay. And there we have read that uh, no order of the civil court can get the property. Okay. Okay. Yes. What do you understand by police diary? So, ma'am, the provision of police diary has been provided under section 172 of CRPC. It is where the police receives an information regarding the commission of a cognizable offence. It is there, then you will start a volume and paginated diary in which you would record day-to-day -day proceedings of the investigation from the time when you received the information, the time that you started investigation, you concluded the investigation, certain observations that were made. So it is basically the investigating officer, he is thinking out loud in that case diary everything relating to the investigation in a particular case. Okay. Okay. Can a accused have access to the diary? So, sir, case diary is not evidence, so the accused person cannot have access to it, but there is an exception to the principle as well. In which circumstances he can say? that he should have access to this person. So sir, when the court uses the case diary to contradict the investigating officer or the investigating officer has used that diary to refresh his memory, it is only in these circumstances that the accused person can call to the diary. Sir, uh, I just want to do that. Uh, what is the DUNS examination? Uh, I'm not very really sure about it. Well, there was a question in uh, Haryana and Punjab also. This, this question. They have used this abbreviation. Ah, uh, yes. How uh, is it Sir, it is provided under Order 18 Rule 16. Uh, whenever a person is going abroad or he is not uh, well, some kind of immediate uh, examination is to be done by the court that can be done under. No, even before bringing the issues up, yes. it can be done at the initial stage, even if the issues have not been framed, or still at the stage of filing a written statement, that can be done. Yes. Yes, can you tell us if an interim order can be passed under Section 6 of Specific Relief Act? So, sir, Section 6 Specific Relief Act, because it deals with a summary remedy, so yes, the interim orders can be passed on it. For example, there can be appointment of a receiver as an interim order. And whether such decrees or such orders are appealable? Uh, no, sir. Such decree as a general rule is not appealable. But there has been an exception which was laid down in the case of Benita versus Pravna that if it is a single judge of the High Court that has passed an order under Section 6, then the appeal can lie to the division bench. Single judge has passed that order in which capacity? Whether as a appellate court or? So, sir, it would be in his original capacity as an original court that he passes. Yes, under the provisions of uh, letters. Yes, letters. Yes, you. Cross examination. 
usually conducted by a cross party. Can a party cross examine its own witnesses? Uh, yes, ma'am. The party, that is the prosecution, can also cross examine its own witnesses. It is when the witness has been declared hostile, then you can do so with the permission of the court. Which provisions of which act deals with it? So, ma'am, hostile witness has been dead under Section 154 of the Indian Evidence Act. Uh, what are the provisions to the person when the plaintiff was rejected? So ma'am, when the plaint is rejected, in such cases, the person has an option because the rejection of the plaint is not on the merits of the case. So he do has an option to either institute a fresh suit on the same proceedings and also the rejection of a plaint is an appealable order. So an appeal can be filed. Okay, Order 37, summary procedure. Uh, a maiden, a proper agreement between a party has been arrived that uh, A will pay B to be standards for maintenance as they have divorced. Can this particular suit be filed under Order 37? So the suit can be filed under Order 37? Ma'am, if you could just give me a minute to recollect the provisions of Order 37. Oh, yes, you are. Order 37 deals with some issue. So there is proper liquidated amount that court is not to find out the pro proper amount of damages what are there. So we have particular amount so court can, uh, the parties can file a civil suit under order 37 some issue because they have the amount. Court is not to assert that amount. Thank you. Alright, I think this will suffice. Very good, Haram. We have given right answers. We hope you will give answers. In like this, in this manner, we hold that you are constituted by the High Court. Answer. All the best.